This is Transit Unplugged. I'm Paul Comfort. Good to be with you on another edition of the world's leading transit executive podcast, Transit Unplugged. News and views this week with our special guest, Jarrett Walker, in part two of his interview, where he talks about the things that we should be looking for in public transit agencies as we plan the new routes to meet the needs of today's customers in a post-pandemic world. Elections were held in the United States recently, uh, last week, and the November 22 midterm elections in the United States saw voters approve 14 of the 19 transit measures put before them in communities across the country. Among the measures approved are a tax on high-income earners in Massachusetts with a portion of the revenue supporting transit investments, a more than $52 million bond in Arlington County, Virginia, where transit will benefit from the funds and various millage renewals in Michigan. The measures passed add to the 15 that have already been passed by voters in 2022, bringing the total to 29 out of 36 wins for transit, which is over an 80 percent win rate and represents billions of dollars in transit investments. Tuesday's results add to a string of historic years for transit at the ballot box with more than 85 percent of measures winning for public transit initiatives between the years of 2017 and 2022. At a time when the federal government is more committed than ever to funding transit and infrastructure, it appears that voters agree and are putting their money where their mouth is to provide the local match. The uh, some of the other big victories for public transit for last week's elections include an extension of a half cent sales tax for 30 years in San Francisco, California. This measure will allow the local transportation authority to issue up to one point nine one billion dollars in bonds for transportation projects. As I mentioned, a statewide ballot initiative in Massachusetts would place an additional 4% tax on earners over $1 million, in addition to the existing 5% flat rate state income tax to generate revenue of $1.3 billion to be used for education, roads, bridges, and public transportation. There was a $52.6 million bond to fund a variety of transportation, road, and pedestrian enhancement projects and transit projects across Arlington County, Virginia, and two propositions to stay with CAP Metro and maintain public transit service in Lago Vista and Manor, Texas, joining a similar victory earlier this year in Leander, Texas. In Michigan, there was a levy of 0.478 millage to continue the Bay Area Transit Authority's bus service in Grand Traverse and Leelanau County for four years and several other similar measures, including a four-year 0.996 millage tax for smart services in Wayne County and a 10-year countywide 0.95 millage rate to fund smart bus transportation system and expand mass transit in Oakland County. In Colorado, there was extensions of um, a small part of the sales tax in Boulder County and a sales tax increase in Eagle County for Transit Authority, an extension of the Pikes Peak Regional Transportation Authority's one cent sales tax for 10 years. And um, a couple measures fell short that I wanted you to know about. The big one for me is a sales tax measure for transportation in Hillsborough County, Florida which uh, just under 52% of the people voted against that. And that had faced some legal challenges in past weeks. That's, you know, where Tampa, Florida is, where Hart is. Um, In the past few weeks, the judge had removed the item from the ballot until the Court of Appeals issued a stay of that order, but it still failed. Another one that failed was uh, an early renewal of Measure C sales tax in Fresno County and Measure T in Medora County, California. Both measures required two-thirds supermajority of support to pass, and they both fell short of that. Um, A sales tax initiative in Sacramento uh, County, California, that would raise the county sales tax by a half percent uh, for 40 years and raise $8.5 billion to fund dozens of transportation measures. We're still waiting to see how that turns out. Overall, though, a great record on Election Day, again, for voters uh, supporting public transit projects. An interesting uh, new technology that people have been talking about for five or 10 years is vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, or eVTOL. Well, big news out of New York this week, eVTOL developer Archer Aviation and United Airlines announced last Thursday a planned route between Newark Liberty International Airport in New Jersey and the downtown Manhattan heliport. The company said this is the first specific route that has been announced in the eVTOL industry. The flight is expected to take less than 10 minutes, and they're targeting 2025 to begin the service. New York City Mayor Eric Adams lauded the development in the company's press release, saying, we want New York to be a place of bold innovation and outside-the-box thinking. I encourage other companies to follow suit. And um, so that ought to be interesting, huh? 
You know, I was uh, recently, uh, last week, I was in London for Intelligent Transports Magazine's uh, big summit on um, transport innovations. I moderated three panels, talked to a lot of people and around the world, not just here in the United States and Canada, but also in places like Ireland. They're really suffering from the lack of drivers, uh, operators for the bus service. Get this. The city of Joplin here in the United States is suspending fixed route service next week because and they're they're going to continue to provide their pre-scheduled curb to curb demand service, uh, but they are going to cut their fixed route service because they don't have enough drivers. Um, pretty bad news. Cap Metro down in Texas is doing something about it. They've got a new collaboration between Cap Metro in Austin, Texas, and Workforce Solutions Capital Area that'll help develop more than 1,000 local jobs as the Transit Authority revs up its Project Connect Mass Transit program. And uh, they, uh, the board of directors of Cat Metro approved uh, the financing for it. The partnership was contracted for a three-year period with projected launch date of this month as part of the collaboration. The Workforce Solutions Capital Area will work alongside its education and business partners to identify possible candidates from its talent pools to fulfill Cap Metro's workforce needs. They'll help map out in-demand positions and skill sets relevant to Cap Metro's workforce and help attract candidates in operations and management roles. Some key partners in their collaborative pipeline include the Central Texas Healthcare Partnership, a manufacturing partnership, a technology workforce coalition, the local community college, local truck driving schools, labor union trade, school districts, and community organizations. Um, During the first year of the program, Cap Metro will hire a staff member strictly dedicated to building out This Project Connect Employment Network, and that'll help support industry sector research and other administrative expenses. They're looking to fulfill three to 400 new bus driver positions in Metro Bus, uh, up to 100 regional rail jobs, 500 new light rail jobs, 75 new facilities positions, and 100 to 150 new Metro access and pickup jobs. So they're moving forward to work with an outside organization to help fill those needs. And finally, a look at the executive suite, the Livermore Amador Valley Transit Authority, or LAVTA Board of Directors, has selected Christy Wegner to serve as the agency's new executive director. She had previously worked there from 2014 to 18 as director of planning and operations for the past four years. She's worked at San Mateo, Santams, and responsible for strategic operations. Congratulations. She said, the wheels bus system is near and dear to my heart. I'm thrilled for the opportunity to return, work with my former colleagues to improve mobility options throughout the Tri-Valley. Congratulations to Christy Wegner in her new position at LAFTA. We'll try to get her on the podcast. Hey, thanks for being with us today on Transit Unplugged. Stay tuned for a great Newsmaker interview with Jarrett Walker. That's perfect. That's not the best. No, and, and that's a great segue to where we're at right now, Jarrett. Uh, post-COVID, it seems like there's been a real shift during the COVID pandemic when ridership was decimated, where transit agencies kind of came to a realization of what you just said, you know, that we maybe we want to be a little bit more about coverage and less less about ridership uh, because our commuter services still are, you know, only at 60 percent or less of what they were. And so what's our real reason to get trial? What's our reason to exist? And I think it is to provide access to mobility for all to all of life's opportunities. So coming out of covid, are you finding that agencies are more focused on kind of that equitable inclusive nature of bus routes like the work you're doing at TriMed and other places? Well, let's, let's, I think we can take that apart into a few different strands. Good. Um, first of all, COVID destroyed rush hour, uh, which is a mixed blessing, but not an entirely bad thing for transit. Right. Um, COVID left us with still very robust, resilient ridership bases in the all day, all the time, all direction uh, kind of service. Um, we talk about essential workers, but really all kinds of people who, for whatever reason, still need to travel and for whatever reason still uh, need or want to use transit are there. And they're coming back, as we know, very slowly. Um, as um, But many of these people are doing things that can't be done from home or that they don't want to do from home. And there are, you know, some of our most intensive transit systems with uh, with the best density, walkability, and linearity are actually back to pre-COVID numbers, not counting rush hour. And so I, I saw statistics recently out of San Francisco now where they have a couple of major urban lines that are back to their pre-COVID margin. 
So, um, and that's obviously in a place where there are just enormous disincentives to driving. Makes sense to use transit. Um, and so lots of people do. So I think that serving those people is the high ridership thing to do now. Now, of course, lots of pundits will are always quick to say that whatever unexpected news has just happened proves that they were right all along. But in this particular case, it does turn out that the kind of efficient high frequency lattice of services that you know we've always found really efficient uh, is the most efficient way to go. In fact, because one of the things that's happened is that downtown has declined as a demand center relative to the rest of the city in almost every city. Uh, it makes sense for our networks to be even more multi-destinational, even more decentralized, even more focused on destinations all over the city than they were before. Um, now, here's the other thing. I don't have to do that for reasons of equity because it's the thing to do for reasons of ridership. It is the high ridership thing to be doing right now. Now, what's happening in terms of coverage, though, I think the other thing that has happened during the pandemic, and of course, it's connected to the to the um, social transformations of 2020, is that we're much more concerned about equity now. We're much more explicitly concerned as a separate evaluation criterion about the experience of low-income and historically marginalized communities. And so then the question becomes, where are those people? Are they in places that a high ridership network would go? If so, great. I don't need an equity justification to serve them. I'm already going to serve them well with a ridership justification. Or are they in places where the only service they could justify would be coverage service because they're in a place that is not dense or walkable or linear. And obviously with the phenomenon of the suburbanization of poverty, more and more low-income and marginalized communities are living in 1950s, 1960s street patterns, which tend to be very geometrically hostile to public transit. And that's a huge problem. So what we're doing in Portland, for example, in the current project I'm doing for TriMet, the Portland Area Transit Agency, is we're putting out a draft plan that says, we're going to plan on two two pillars, ridership and equity. And the network is going to be optimized for ridership, except that we are going to provide coverage where we have low-income or historically marginalized communities and only there. So if you look at the plan that's on exhibit right now at trinet.org slash forward, you'll see that what it does is moves is cut service in areas that are both low ridership and relatively high income with relatively few marginalized communities. And it adds coverage in places that are the opposite, in, in, in places that are still, we know to be low ridership, but where we know we have a lot of low income or marginalized, marginalized communities. And so there is new coverage there. So there's been a shift in the focus of coverage so that the coverage service, the predictably low ridership service is much more focused on equity rather than as it was before being kind of thinly spread across the entire region. Now, that's a very strong policy choice. And I want to be clear, I'm not advocating it. What we're doing is putting this map up out there to see what people think, because TriMet has heard a lot of people saying equity, 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 and it's time to draw a picture of that so that people can decide how much equity they really want. Because obviously, you know, there are places that the draft plan, you know, cut service to some places and add service in other places and people need to see. And, and anyone who knows the city and knows the demographic pattern of the city will will look at that and immediately understand why uh, we're cutting service from relatively affluent places. But um but that's that's a question to the region. So that's the that's the other thing. Now there's a third piece of what you just raised about the impact of COVID, and that's what's happened to the peak. At the peak, so, right. So the notion that the peak was always the highest ridership and most efficient thing we could do was sometimes true. And of course, we have whole transit agencies like commuter rail lines that are almost entirely about the peak. Um, but on the other hand, peak only service, sending out a bus or train for only a couple of hours is really expensive and inefficient. Yep. It's, in, it's expensive and inefficient in three ways. You have to own a vehicle and own and maintain a vehicle that you don't use very much. You have to um, pay a driver to go to work for two hours, which means you're going to pay them a full hour, um, or if not, even pay them for a full day shift, depending on how your labor contract looks. But you're, you're using labor very inefficiently. 
Uh, and finally, you're almost certainly running a, a vehicle that's full in one direction and empty in the other direction. And so um, when, you know, the laptop commuter is on a bus that's maybe even has a person in almost every seat say, wow, this bus is really productive. Well, you have to keep in mind, it's actually only about half that productive because, <laughs> the, because the bus ran empty in the other direction. Right. And it's even less than that because of all the other inefficiencies associated with peak pullouts. Um so many driver complaints about peak call so many of the problems of the quality of life of our workforce associated with split shifts, right? The yes. youngest, right? The youngest drivers who have young children get the, get the split shifts, which means they don't see their children in the evening when those children are most impressionable and when they most need to bond with them. All kinds of larger kinds of social problems that arise from split shifts and the effect on younger drivers. So this has a silver lining. Because peak only service was so expensive, the ability, you know, I can take a peak only revenue, uh, I can take a peak only quantum of service, a peak only bus hour of service and turn it into more than one bus hour of all day service. And so, you know, where that has been a great opportunity to build the kind of all day, all direction, all the time networks. Now, obviously, if downtowns come back and that kind of demand comes back, you know, transit will have to be there for them. But I hope, I hope as a result also, Transit will be able to be more efficient in coming back to those markets. Um, because in the past, I think we sometimes overserved those markets. You know, the 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 rush hour commuters with laptops had um are were mostly relatively um educated people who knew how to get their needs met, knew how to advocate and how to get their needs met. Um, had often, you know, powerful interests in the business community speaking up specifically for their needs as opposed to other people's needs. So I, I think, you know, we certainly are going to, as an industry, going to want to be there for rush hour and be there for the, the, um, the laptop um, rush hour commute, if indeed it comes back and to the extent that it comes back. But I don't, but I think we understand now more than we did before that those are not our premium customers or our most important customers, which I think was often the attitude before. They are among our customers and, but they are not, um, they're not really, they're not the only thing that transit should be designed for. Jared, if people want to find out more about the topics we've been talking about, you've got a great website. Tell us about that, where they should look and about your book, et cetera. So the website's humantransit.org. And if you go there, there's a section called, I know there's a thousand articles there, but there's yeah. a section called basics uh, or humantransit.org slash basics, which will take you to a curated set of articles that are really good introductions to a whole bunch of basic transit planning topics that many people don't understand. I really encourage people to go explore that. Uh, there's also a book, Human Transit, where I lay out a lot of these ideas at book length that's been very useful to a lot of people. The firm is Jarrett Walker and Associates, jarrettwalker.com. Great way to wrap it up. Well, we could talk for another hour, Jared. This is good stuff. Uh, if people want to know more, as I mentioned, he's got a bunch of articles that you can read for free at humantransit.org. Got a great book out. Um, and uh, we really appreciate you taking some time with our listeners today around the world, talking about some of the concepts uh, that come into play as we analyze what our transit service is all about. <laughs> the, the one quote that I want to leave us with is, uh, you may have been the originator of it, but my friend Kevin Quinn who was our planning director in Baltimore and now is at TransLink, always tells me, Paul, remember, frequency equals freedom. And that is for everyone to get to all of life's opportunities. Jared, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much, Paul. We hope you're enjoying this episode of Transit Unplugged, the podcast. How would you like to see behind the scenes footage of the agencies that Paul visits? then be sure to check out the new Transit Unplugged TV on YouTube, where transit evangelist Paul Comfort dives into the culture, the food, and the transit of major cities around the world. You'll see the operations control centers, how maintenance shops work, and the latest innovations taking place at agencies around the globe as we work together to improve the lives of our transit riders and our communities. Be sure to subscribe to Transit Unplugged TV on YouTube or at transitunplugged.com. Hi, I'm Alea Carey, a communications consultant who loves working with public transit agencies. And today, I have a really bad cold. So let's talk about wellness messaging on transit two and a half years after the launch of the pandemic. 
Transit agencies had to get really smart very quickly about wellness messaging when we were all learning quickly about the right protocols to help prevent the coronavirus from spreading. We often used brighter colors, bigger type, and off-brand imaging to get the public's attention. These days, COVID is a more manageable threat, but it has helped us learn the value of keeping passengers healthy. How can we keep our wellness messaging from becoming stale? Start with thinking about relevancy. Flu season offers us a great timely opportunity to get more audience attention. Social media channels and bus interiors are especially good places to promote messaging about not traveling when you're sick and following basic safety protocols like hand washing and social distancing when possible. You can also consider partnering with local social service agencies, your libraries and school systems to get your messaging out and to also share their messaging on your marketing channels. Their designs and language will be different from yours, and that will help messaging stand out for everyone. If you'd like to talk more about health and wellness messaging or anything else related to communications and public transit, look me up on LinkedIn. My first name is spelled E-L-E-A, last name C-A-R-E-Y. Oh, and wash your hands and drink plenty of fluids. Hi, this is Mike Bismar, Regional Sales Director for Proterra, and this is Mike's Minute, where we talk about leadership, mentorship, and kindness with the hopes it'll inspire you to pay it forward. I happen to be recording this segment on Sunday, November the 13th, which is World Kindness Day. So I'll be heading out later today to commit a couple random acts of kindness in my community, but that inspired me as well for this week's segment. Combining that with last week's segment that Alea had on when to PR and not to PR, when to share a story via public relations. Well, she mentions that typically it's while you have something new to talk about, breaking news or something relevant to topical current events. Combine that with a great quote from Paul's latest book from Robbie Mackinnon, where he talks about the rock stars of the agency, folks that go above and beyond, people who go into work every day knowing they'll make a difference in somebody's life. Well, it really reiterates the message that I try and lead by. Always try to change the narrative. So PR now, PR the positive. The difference-making stories at your agency. We all have them, folks that go above and beyond their normal job description and have an amazing impact on others. Perhaps not even while on the job, but in their personal lives. They are change makers in their communities, working with local charities, nonprofits, and other entities that they're passionate about. It's time to call them out, celebrate their success and kindness, and help change that narrative in your organization with your local media. Coming out of World Kindness Day, my challenge is for all of you to write a story or start an internal recognition program identifying these acts of kindness by your team. It will have an impact on morale, workplace culture, and it will inspire others to do the same. Kindness is contagious. Kindness is cool. Thanks for listening. And now look at the future of public transportation. Hey, I want to uh, let everybody know that uh, thank you for your support for our new book, Conversations on Equity and Inclusion in Public Transportation. As of this recording, uh, in its third week after its release, the book is still ranked number one on Amazon's new mass transit bestsellers list. The book features best practices and interesting stories from over 20 top public transportation leaders in the public and private sector. It's a great place to learn new approaches for your agency or company. Uh, This book is also receiving great reviews. And if you get yourself a copy of the book, please help us spread the message by leaving your own review. Uh, The paperback version uh, is now available. On Thursday, November 17th, it it dropped and you can pick up a paperback version. And as I mentioned, um, it is a great way to learn what these uh, other agencies are doing right now. Practical guidance, hands-on guidance on what's happening in public transportation to help improve equity and inclusion in the cities we serve, but also in the agencies and companies we lead. I think you'll find it fascinating stories from some of these leaders uh, who you've heard their names of all on this show many times before, but it's mostly them talking. and. and the conversations they have with me about it. Speaking of conversations, uh, I just got back from London last week and had great conversations uh, with a number of transportation leaders. I was there for the, um, there's a magazine that's based out of Britain, but it is uh, read around the world by thousands and thousands of subscribers. And it's called uh, Intelligent Transport. Uh, the editor is Leah Hockley. And uh, the the they also host conferences. And this was the, uh, their Transport Innovation Summit held in London. It was held at Twickenham Stadium, which is England's uh, national rugby stadium. I learned so much while I was there about rugby. I didn't know a whole lot about it. You know, the best way that was described to me was rugby is kind of like uh, American football without helmets. 
there's so much tradition uh, around at the stadium, you know, all these paintings of forever England is one of the pictures up on the wall right by the president's box um, when it has the pictures of the last rugby team that won the Triple Crown before World War I and some of the players were killed in World War I by snipers and other things. And they have all these stories, and great rich tradition. And then out on the field, uh, there's all these electric lights on the field and there's all this technology uh, being used to keep the uh, the turf as best as it can be. And I, I thought of the great analogy that was for public transportation, how there is in places like London, such a rich history and tradition of the tube and, uh, you know, the subway, I think the first subway in the world and all that uh, was there. But now all the greatest and latest technology, uh, Simon Reed was there with me, my friend, uh, who's head of technology at TFL for surface transport. And we actually interviewed him for a TV show, but talking about all the great new technology they're bringing into play to make sure we meet the needs of today's customers. And that was kind of the theme uh, of the show for me. I moderated three panels with numerous transit officials, had great feedback from the conference organizers. There was about 500 people registered for the conference. Some uh, watched online, some were there in person. We filmed two of the panels uh, with a professional film crew. And we plan to use some of the footage for our January episode of the Transit Unplugged TV show. We'll have folks on there, including Lola Sanchez, Director General of Mobility at the Madrid City Council, uh, Mina Soininen, Director of the Finnish Public Transport Authority and Chair of UITP, their EU committee, Vernon Everett, my friend and former guest on the show, Transport Commissioner for Greater Manchester. We interviewed him as well as Tshepo Kagobi, who is COO at Gautrain, a high-speed rail service in South Africa um, out of Johannesburg. I also gave away 40 copies, advanced copies of my new book, Conversations on Equity and Inclusion in Public Transportation, uh, to some of the uh, those nation's leaders. We had an event where we gave out those books to them. I was able to interview Mike Bagshaw, who is Chief Operating Officer of MTR UK for the podcast. His interview will run in January. Uh, they're the company that's uh, well known for what they do in Hong Kong uh, for some of their unique payment methodologies where they use the the revenue from rental of shopping centers above the subway stations uh, to pay for the service 100%. Their company also is responsible for running the Elizabeth line, the brand new rail line that TFL just opened up. And, uh, you know, we talked about all that was just just a week or two ago, they finally connected it all together. We talked about all that and and the queen coming and being there at the opening. It's a, it's a fascinating interview, I think you'll find. Uh, we also filmed interviews, as I mentioned, for our Transit Unplugged TV show. But we included Anne Graham, CEO of the Irish National Transport Authority. Uh, she's a great friend of the show. She's been on the show before. I'm hoping to be with her next June in uh, for an event we're going to do, CEO Roundtable, that we'll hopefully do at the UITP conference in Spain. Uh, Simon Reed, we interviewed him for the show out by one of the bus stops. It's great seeing the double-decker buses there. Uh, Vernon Everett, um, the, I already mentioned him, Commissioner of Public Transport for Greater Manchester. They're doing so many cool things there with Beeline Transit. Uh, they've lowered the daily rates uh, for people to use the service, cut them in half, actually. And they've seen an increase in ridership. Mike Bagshaw is on the show. Uh, Paul Attenborough and Josh Mellon, Meller from Trapeze. And Leah Hockley is also on the show. And we lined up a number of also future interviews with other folks for the podcast. I think um, you'll really look forward to some of the uh, European guests that we've got lined up for the show. So great time in London. Thank you so much to... Um, Darren and Hillary and the folks at Trapeze UK for helping to organize everything there. Next, uh, while you're listening to this, I'm going to be in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, I'll be at the upcoming, uh, what's called Commotion LA, one of the world's coolest shows. I love going to Commotion. We just did a show with them down in Miami. And now this is the one in LA, the main show, uh, the first one they had going. And uh, we'll be filming an episode of the TV show there. Uh, but also I'll be moderating a panel and I've, I've already done the prep session with the folks and it'll be on the stage on November 16th at 11.15 with Jennifer Vidas, who is the uh, Chief Customer Experience Officer of LA Metro. We're going to be talking about building back ridership. Greg Spott, who is uh, Director of the Seattle DOT, uh, David DeCozen, who's Vice President of Business Development at Cubic, Shinpei Se, who is uh, Director of uh, Global Policy for Cities and Transportation at Uber, uh, a great panel looking at all the different facets of how we might want to build back ridership. The good thing is here in the U.S., and really what I found out last week in Europe across the world, is that transportation ridership actually is up at about 70 to 80 percent now in most of the main services in cities, not so much in the commuter services, but they're seeing an increase 
in ridership on uh, nights and weekends to events. So uh, transit agencies are adjusting uh, the routes so to make sure they have more service available at those times. Many places have told me, at least a half dozen of them have told me lately, their CEOs, that ridership on weekends on what was traditionally called commuter rail, but now sometimes is being called regional rail, is up even more than it was prior to the pandemic as people are using it to kind of get out and about into towns to see sport events and museums and and uh, getting out to uh, see various events in towns on the weekends, et cetera. So uh, as Lauren Skyver says, CEO of Sunline Transit, we shouldn't be selling what people aren't buying. And so transit agencies are adjusting and adapting their routes, just like Jarrett talked about today on today's podcast, really adapting the routes and the service offerings that we make to the needs of today's clientele to make sure that we're providing equity and inclusion in all that we do. Thanks for being with us this week and every week on Transit Unplugged as we bring you insightful interviews and news and information about the transit industry, the world's number one source right here on Transit Unplugged. I'm Paul Comfort. Stay safe out there. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Transit Unplugged News and Views, part two of our special two-part episode with Jarrett Walker, transit planner and consultant. Now, next week, we're back to regular programming. We have Dave Rigi of Halifax Transit with us on the show. Now, don't forget to go to transitunplugged.com to sign up for the newsletter so you're always in the loop with whatever's going on on the show and whenever new episodes are published. In the meantime, if you have a question, comment, or want to be a guest on the show, feel free to email us anytime at info at transitunplugged.com. So until next week, ride safe and ride happy.